All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Jim Knight, who is over the other side of the country in Florida. <laughs> yes. How are you doing, Jim? I'm doing great. Yeah, it's sunny over here. I bet it's probably nicer weather in San Diego. It always is. Um, yeah, kind of. It's kind of windy today, you know, but hey, listen, when, if ever you complain about weather in San Diego, people kind of get angry with you. Right, so exactly. I try yeah, to you keep should, it to myself. You should be punched. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. And I am regularly, so, you know, but that's that's, an, that's another story altogether. Totally different show, yes. <laughs> and so Jim is award-winning training and development veteran, cultural catalyst who speaks on a variety of topics. Um, and during your 21 career, with the Hard Rock International, you uh, your creativity and success garnered you several uh, industry awards for cutting edge uh, training. And you have this book that uh, was released just in May uh, this year, right? Yeah, um, just a couple of days ago, yeah. A couple of days ago called Leadership That Rocks, Take Your Brand Culture to 11 and Amp Up. And for anybody under the age of, I don't know what, yeah, there's the book. <laughs> Yeah, they might not know the reference. You'll have to give they it to them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Probably uh, one of my all-time favorite movies. Um, when I was in my, I have to say, when I was in my twenties, we used to myself and my friends, like you know, we share various flats and that in Dublin. We just used to watch Spinal Tap over, over and, and over, over. And over on a VHS tape. It's just <laughs> you know, we come back in the early hours of the morning for being out, and everybody be like. <laughs> Oh, put on Spinal Tap. And we knew all the words by by heart. So the reference to 11 is when Nigel Tufnell, the um, the guitarist, yeah. has the amplifier. And he goes, he goes, our amplifier goes up to 11. Uh, most amplifiers go to 10, ours go to 11. That's one louder. And the guy, of course, just says, uh, well, can you just make 10 louder? And then he just looks at him like. But, the, but these uh, go to 11. Yeah, these go to, <laughs> ours go to 11. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. All right. So, so give me a, a background on on uh, sort of the genesis of the book and and what and what is your concept and how can you get people's brand to eleven? Yeah. So you know, first off, thanks a lot for having me on the show, John. I uh, my background was in music education. I went to school and I do have a music degree, but then I was also a public middle school teacher for six years. But like you alluded. It was really my 21 years at Hard Rock that really set the stage. And although now that I think about it, I did get a chance to pull all of those levers, music, education, hospitality. I wrote a book in 2014 called Culture That Rocks. And I really did that because I was just jumping off of that awesome brand. I mean, Hard Rock at that time was probably one of the greatest stories in the history of stories. And I just, um, I love that brand. I love the people that work there. Some of the most interesting collection of humans I'd ever seen on the planet. Um, like you said, we were talking about hair care products and hairstyles before we, we went live. Um, you know, you, you hang out with hard rockers that had tattoos and piercings and mohawks, but yet their work ethic and their attention to detail and sense of urgency is just unparalleled. And so I loved writing a book because I thought I could get other companies and brands and industries to really uh, jump on board and, and have great cultures. Well, the problem is that was eight, nine years ago. It's a hard cover. It's color on the inside. It's expensive. It's heavy as I'll get out. And I said, you know what? I'm going to pull the, the main tenants out of that. And so this first book, which you'll probably be able to see right at the very top, it'll have a number one on there. It'll say Culture That Rocks series. This is the first in a series of three. Uh -huh. So this year it'll be Leadership That Rocks. Next year it'll be Service That Rocks. And then the year after that will be Engagement That Rocks. Service, Leadership, and Engagement. If you put them together, they would make up the essence of my older book. But obviously, I have a chance to put a white hot spotlight on companies and, and cultures that I just have fallen madly in love with. So it's kind of a 2.0. But in this case, it's specifically about how can you go and lead and maintain a great, awesome culture. And so it really was written for new and up and coming leaders. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think it's a great it's a great subject and, and it's a great uh, it, it's a great concept that you built around the book. So just going back to the hard rock for a moment. Sure. Uh, I think one of one of the things that I think clearly stood out there is that the hard rock knew what its brand was. 
knew yeah. who it, knew who it was and and anywhere you went to a hard rock re regardless of where it was the experience was the same because yeah. everybody knew, everybody knew and 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 from your point of view uh number one how did they create that and second off that is obviously what most companies should strive for is to have a uh, have a culture of a brand that everybody understands and is yep. and lives lives and breathes it's funny that you say that because it, it is a nice uh, balance. You know, I like to think I'm both entertaining and educational. So I talk about mm -hmm. edutainment. I think mm -hmm. Hard Rock really has, took the same idea. I think they said, we're going to be consistent when it comes to the product quality, to the service, but yet we're going to be so completely different regardless of which property you walk into. So you and I are, are Gen Xers. I think you know, people that are a little bit younger, maybe on the millennial side, the Gen, the Gen Z side, I think, you know, they might not know everything about hard rock, but usually the food's going to be great. The ambiance is going to be fantastic. They're going to hear awesome music. Usually a lot of that's now proprietary music. There's real authentic rock and roll gear on the walls, which mm -hmm. by the way, the majority of that stuff wasn't at the inception. That wasn't what the original founders intended. It just sort of all became some really cool, happy accidents. But you know, John, you make a great point when you travel the world and I opened up something like 80 different properties in 40 countries. I had a great charmed life working for that company. I could say that I could go to the other side of the planet and I knew what I was gonna get. And yet it was also so completely different. No, there's no cookie cutter, there's no four walls. They were all, oh my God, I gotta go in there type buildings. But even the people were just so, unique and different. And I, I just think unique people create unique experiences. And so to your point, there's a lot of consistency and, and that's what a lot of expatriates, expats, we like to say in the States, you know, they, they crave that when they're on vacation. Um, it isn't just a, a, you know, another themed place to go to, mm -hmm. but for the locals, it probably is a theme. You probably don't even think about going there unless, you know, your mom or your friends are in town or something like that. But I think right along with the consistency is this this authenticity that just blows people's mind. And I don't know that they're even expecting it when they walk in. Yeah, no, it's a great point. And I think from what you're talking about there is, um, which is, I love that you brought that out, is that there's a consistency, but also there's an authenticity and an individual, you know, there's individuality as well. Yeah. So, and obviously that comes from, you have to create, the, the leadership has to create that. And as you said, that's an incredible, that's in a balancing act, isn't it? Where you keep the brand consistent, but you also allow people to express themselves individually and authentically. Well, I think, yes. And I think, you know, maybe the two founders uh, really just decided right at the, the onset, we're going to immerse ourselves in the spirit of rock and roll and rock and roll is for the people. It's a little bit dirtier. It's a little bit more irreverent and unpredictable, but you know, what you do get is passion. And like I said, mm -hmm. authenticity. And, and I think people love that. I think what you get with that is loyalty, both for the consumer, the guests that are walking in, but even for the, the hard rockers, the team members, when, when I can work and be and say and do whatever I want and be on a first name basis with the boss and look the way I want to, I mean, that where else would you want to go? And so people just never left the brand. And so I think the founders really decided right at the front, if we do start making more of these, you know, and it took them something like 18 years to create the second one. Uh -huh. I mean, it didn't blow up all over the place, but even now you can travel the globe and there are some markets, some countries that only have one property. You know, they didn't want to be on every street corner because they really wanted to make sure that it was going to be a place that a lot of people were going to be driven to. So they focused on that a lot. And now, you know, they've got different owners and uh, the focus is on the hotels and the casinos. Casino sure. money is where it's all at. So I don't know if there's as much of a focus anymore on the cafes, but the brand is still alive and still existing, even through all of the different competitors that came and went. And I was just fortunate to be a part, actually half of the time that the brand's been in existence, I was a part of that. And uh, yeah. I serve at the pleasure of the Hard Rock brand even today when I go on the road, I'm looking for a good burger. Or I want to stay in one of their beds. It's just, that runs through my veins, man. I love it. Um, and then in your book, you say one of the chapters, you say it, it, it starts with you. And I think this is a great and I, and I love when people call out things like that, because 
I think we we live in this world today where I think people are, are you know expect everything right they expect yeah. it to be could to be honest they expect it to be given to them yeah. and and when it comes to anything like you know accountability or whatever that it's all great as long as uh, it's like yeah, Jim should be held accountable, but what about me holding myself accountable? Yes. Well, no, no, I don't want to do that. I just, I prefer <laughs> to hold Jim accountable. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you know, I think it's, uh, it, I'm glad that you brought that up. I mean, I'm such a huge believer, and this is probably the human resource, and so maybe the middle school teacher and me coming out. I believe that everything is learned behavior, everything. It's the difference between us and the rest of the animal kingdom. You learn everything. You are the way that you are, John, because you learned it from school and your parents and the playground and your friends and religion or lack of religion. By the time you come to me as some 21-year-old kid wanting a job, you know, you, you are the way you are. And if your natural disposition isn't to smile or, or have a good personality around other people, that's going to be a problem, right? Particularly in the industry that I worked in, unless I maybe, I don't know, had a place in the very back office where no one would ever see you, which is unlikely. And, and I used to think I was an awesome trainer. I can tell you for a fact, I can't train you to smile. Either, you either want to do it or, or you don't. I can't train you to have a good personality. So I guess when I say it starts with you, I'm always trying to, to turn the mirror around and say, listen, you know, the, the work ethic that's going to get you to the next level, the, the, the mindset of being philanthropic, the, the idea that you've got to look at things as not happening to you, but happening for you and using those experiences to, to again, perpetuate whatever your brand is or to impact and influence other people, whatever it is, it literally is you. And, and people that just go, well, it was me or to your point, they feel sort of entitled and it's going to be spoon fed. You know, I, I just, I do people get away with it? Absolutely. Yeah. It just frustrates me to no end. And I just feel if you're going to be a leader and, and really have some credibility, you're going to have to look at yourself in the mirror and say, I can, I can have some self accountability. I can focus yeah. on myself first, then I'll manage and lead other people. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think the other thing, in my experience, the other thing that you can't teach people is hard work. I think that's something yeah. that uh, something that you develop. You know, it's an innate thing you develop over time. But I think by the time you hit the workforce, it's not something that somebody else can teach you. That's right. Uh, well, and but you said innate too. So again, innate implies that you're sort of born with it, and it's not. I think you you're surrounded. Again, yeah, it yeah, sucks to have correct. to put people on the spot, but you go. It's your parents, it's your friends, it's your mm -hmm. education. It's how you were supported as you grow up. I, and by the way, I'm not saying you can't have great work ethic later in life. I'm just going to say it's a lot harder, <laughs> you know, because you, you have to change the way that you are. And sometimes mm -hmm. those zebras can't change your stripes, right? Mm -hmm. And then you talk about being the catalyst for change. Uh, yeah. And this is, and I always think this is interesting because it's a weird, it's, it's a weird paradox that humans have, right? Is our whole world is in a constant state of flux and change. But it seems like when, it, when, we, when we get to work, we try and actually keep everything very contained and not changing right. and rigid and demar. <laughs> and it's such a bizarre, I was found it is such a bizarre contradiction because that's not the way the world is. But yet when we get to work, we try and keep it and we hate change and we try and keep everything in order and in the order that we think it should be that yes. works for us, that works for us normally, not for anyone else. Exactly. It's so funny. I mean, you're so right. It's uh, Bob Dylan had a great quote out there about the one thing you can guarantee is change, which is also an, an oxymoron, right? It's, it's a paradox there. And it's sort of the, you know, we, we can always guarantee that there's death and taxes, but I say change. We're constantly changing and change is going to come no matter what times they are changing. So mm -hmm. you can either lean into it. You can accept it. When you get in a leadership role, you maybe even start to influence the change. Maybe you're the one who created the change. Maybe you can read the tea leaves and go, I think we need to get in front of this. But boy, people, you are so right. People get freaked out about it. And when it comes to organizational cultures, when you think about on a macro scale, I'm constantly trying to get more people to say, you've got to get to this mindset of change is awesome. Once you become so stagnant and stale and you sort of get to that plateau, you're of no use to me. And you're going to have a ton of people just zipping past you, competitors that are going to do the same thing you are, by the way, at a cheaper price. And, and when that happens, I can point to a date on the calendar when we start to go out of business. So, you know, you've got to uh, evolve or die, I guess, is the old mindset. I, I always say, you know, if you hate change, you're going to hate extinction. 
not being around <laughs> isn't fun, you know? So yeah. you, you just got to be aware of it, maybe even hyper aware of it the further up you go in the, uh, the leadership ladder. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think you have to be the you have to be the driver of change, and you have to be you have to kind of look at your own business and sort of say, well, if I was going to put myself out of business, what would I do? Yeah. yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, great question. I like that. Yeah. And then you talk about there's another chapter here where you talk about mentorship is instrumental. Uh, yes. So first of all, give me give me a, a definition of what a mentor is from your point of view. Yeah. So even though I broke it down into five different types, I really think, you know, and, and I'm going to be cautious here because I don't want to say that all of your mentors would be smarter than you, but I think the goal should be to constantly challenge yourself. And I'm a big fan of, you know, if it isn't broke, break it. I'm constantly looking, even if I thought something was perfect, I can always make it better. And I guess when you're thinking about your own personal style, your own leadership, there are people around you that that just have so many more skills or experience or expertise than you do. So I do talk about trying to find somebody in a company, outside of a company, even some of your friends, peer mentors, even if you're mentoring someone else, I believe in reverse mentorship that mm -hmm. you can always learn something from someone. And my goal is to just put more arrows in my quiver so that when I walk into a room, I can participate. I can hold a conversation. I can contribute a little bit more than just showing up as a lemming and going, you know, sorry, I've got this one lane that that I swim in. And so there, there you, without going into a lot of detail, I say that all five of those mentor levels are, are used differently, but they all can get you to the next level, whatever that level is. And I'm constantly looking for people that want to be promotable, you know, not that necessarily there's going to be a position, but you know, you're ready to take on more responsibilities. And the reality is you probably aren't able to always get there on your own unless you have that drive, that work ethic that we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. I, I love having people that I can rely on just to bounce ideas off of and, and go, hey, here's something crazy or, you know, this is what just pissed me off. W what do you think about it? And you've got somebody who's in your camp who's cheering you on, who wants to see you succeed. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of mentorship and that chapter, mentorship is instrumental, is, is probably my favorite chapter in the book because it's really granular. I think when people are reading it, they can put different people, people that are in their lives in each of those five slots. That's what, that's the goal anyway, that's what I hope. Yeah, no, it's great, and and uh, and I agree, and I love the way the fact that you have uh, identified different types of mentors, and I think it's, and I always find it kind of fascinating is that um, it's often in your in your work life, in people's work life, is where they don't seek any help. They sort yeah. of feel like, oh, I got to muddle through this on my own. And you're like, well, why, why do you need to muddle through that on your own? To your point, there's a lot of smart people out there. There's a lot of people who've done a lot of different things. And it just seems logic that you would tap into the experience of other people as opposed to trying to do it all on your own. But yet there often seems to be a reluctance to yeah, look you know, for I, help. I think people, you know, I think when you ask for help, it, if people have a fear of it showing weakness, whether it was somebody that that's in a different department on the other side of the building, whether it's your significant other, maybe it's just a really good friend that you've grown up together with and you're doing different things. But once you admit and ask questions with someone, I, I think people feel like they're going to be exposed. Like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I hate asking my friend or my, the, this other mm -hmm. executive because they're going to think I'm not as smart or as good or, or, or that much of an expert in my field. And so I think there's a little bit of a fear factor. Once you get past that, and you just go, why not? These people love me. They, they, mm -hmm. they are brand advocates of me personally and, and I of them. So, you know, when you can find those people in that inner circle probably is small, it's four or five people, you know, um, our good friend, Don Yeager, who's a, was a writer for Sports Illustrated says, you'll never outperform your inner circle. And so you want to find people that challenge you and are elevating you. Uh, and if you're the person who's constantly doing all the mentoring, you know, it's okay to maybe have one of those, but you don't want that to be all of them. But yeah, I, you know, just acknowledge what you were saying. I think it's a fear factor of being exposed, really. And maybe on the flip side as well is like many people don't really think about, you know, playing the role of mentor for people again. Uh, what do you think sort of holds back people from, from offering, their, offering themselves as mentors? Time. Time more than anything else. I, I think people think, oh my gosh, it's going to be such a drag. I mean, I, I'd be lying if I said sometimes when people ask me, 
I have to pick my battles, you know, and, and there's certainly a lot of things I do talk about that in the book, you got to figure out the structure and how do you communicate and how often and what are the rules around it, you know, whether it's from an organization or you just want to do it on your own. But I think most people are reluctant because imagine two, three, four people that you're mentoring, you know, you get one chatty person in there, one person that's pretty needy. Um, it's it's tough to unspool that relationship. So I think people are just a little bit hesitant. They're willing to do it, but I think they really want to make sure that they, they you know, they, they've made it into that inner circle where they feel comfortable. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. So you only want to mentor people who are very driven and they're concise in their communication. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that, to, to some degree, I'm not ashamed to say that. I mean, you know, some people are going to need a little bit more, but if, the, if yeah. you're going to get that person, then just take on one because <laughs> imagine getting five or six of those you're, you're in the ditch. You're not able to do your own stuff. You know, you're fighting their no. battles. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, in closing, what, what is the, what are the, what is the one core uh, point that you would like this book to get across and what is the reason why people should read it? Yeah. And, and maybe I'll answer with a two part uh, answer. I, I do think that, um, you know, I wrote it for up and coming and new leaders. I just have noticed in industries all over the, the world that there's a massive chasm between being a staff member and being a manager, being a leader. And there's not a lot out there for brand new leaders. So I did write it from that perspective. It wasn't written for a CEO to, mm -hmm. to be an epiphany and change their mind. What I would love is the CEO to read it, to go, wow, he or she wants to get it into the hands of all of their people. But the second part is I, I have this great quote, and I did this in my first book, but I used it as sort of an anchor in this one. I do believe that a single person with some great ideas can start a revolution. And I think that's how, you know, dictator led countries are overthrown. That's how I think philanthropic yeah. movements are started. That's how I think cultures are changed. I just think if you've got some goods, you've got the skills, you actually have some ideas don't hold that back because I do have a lot of middle managers that go, what's the difference? I don't have any direct reports. I'm not really the boss. I don't really make the big decisions. And, you know, I was in the same boat, but one win, one W after another. And at some point your responsibilities grow. And so I would say when I was seating tables, when I first started the company, just as a long haired kid having fun and it was burgers and t-shirts and rock and roll 21 years later, I'm running training and development for the joint and I've affected the brand, you know, for thousands of people. I mean, if I can do it, anybody can do it. So that's, that's really the crux. I, I hope people can grab it as an anchor and go, I think I can make a difference if I work for a company that I'm madly in love with and I really want to amp it up to make it successful. Yeah. And, and I know, I think that's a fantastic message. And I think the, the other part is like, and I know even from my own career is like, yeah, things can happen if you just, if you're open to opportunities and then you grab those opportunities, even if you don't know where they're going to lead. That's right. And, and more importantly, even if it means you have to change things, you have to move, maybe you have, maybe you'll be perceived differently by other people, whatever it is. Uh, exactly. Move yeah. forward, move forward. Yeah. That long and winding road isn't going to always take you where you expected yeah. it. But, you know, if you do it the right way and let's go all the way back to what you're saying, you've got this great attitude, you got a great work ethic. Listen, when you get to Nirvana, that 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 encore is going to be so much sweeter for all the hard you know, work and sweat and tears that you put in. Yeah, I love it. Listen, uh, Jim, this has been fantastic. All of Jim's information is going to be below this video, including links to the book uh, and his other book any other, and anything else that uh, Jim has done. Uh, but before we go, just tell people a little bit more about yourself, Jim. Yeah, um, I sort of went through the, the background, but now I'm a, a keynote speaker by trade. That's what I do. I go off and speak at different conferences. I do about 45 to 50 of those a year. I'm an author, mm -hmm. obviously. I'm a podcaster uh, as well, and I'm a book marketer. So I have a book marketing company with a good friend of mine. And uh, you can find any of that stuff at nightspeaker.com. That's my last name, K-N-I-G-H-T, speaker.com. All roads lead to that. But John, thank you so much, man, for having me on the show. This is a big honor. Well, no, thank you. This has been fantastic. Love the subject. Love the book. Love the hair. And uh, <laughs> yes. we're all good to go. <laughs> we'll put hair care products in the show notes we, as well. We will. We will. And next time I'll even dig up some pictures of me when I was young. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Before and after for both of us. That would be awesome. Exactly. I love it. All right. Listen, thank you, Jim. Thank you for watching and listening. And I'll see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Rock on.